Um, today I'm going to be going over throwing a cylinder. So we're going to talk about some of the basics of wheel throwing, uh, kind of the, what's happening with it. Um, cylinders are essentially how you make everything. So if you can't throw a cylinder, you can't pretty much make hardly anything on the wheel. Um, cylinders seem boring. Cylinders require a lot of practice. Uh, and don't let that stop you should probably do cylinders more or less constantly. Um, I would say even if you're working on throwing something specific, uh, try and uh, at the beginning of a wheel throwing session, give yourself a chance to throw just three basic cylinders. Try and make them all the same size. And, um, well, you'll, you'll see why, why it's so important. So anyhow, uh, first off, let's talk about the potter's wheel. I'm gonna be throwing standing this is about a correct position for a standing wheel. Most classes we teach wheel throwing sitting, and that's mostly for convenience. It's not really a good ergonomic choice. We do it because having to rearrange the heights of all the wheels all the time constantly is just a huge problem. But if you continue with wheel throwing, if you do a lot of it, if you do it for production, you need to throw standing. You should not be throwing sitting. When you're throwing sitting, Every pound of pressure that you put on the clay this way transmits across your back and right to your lower spine. So you're basically crushing your own lower vertebrae uh, every time you're working the wheel. And that position, that kind of being bent over, hunched, is opening up those vertebrae and it, it helps bring about something called a bulging disc. Um, very common injury for wheel throwers. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, research done on this. It's just not really good for you. So if we're just learning for the first couple of classes, it's fine, but if you're going to continue, you want to throw standing. Um, most potter's wheels, a five-gallon bucket is about the right height, um, or sorry, two five-gallon buckets is about the right height for standing. Um, it doesn't take a lot, really, to, to make a, a, a wheel stand, so don't let that stop you from having one. Uh, and a couple of the wheel manufacturers have standing wheel Kind of leg systems. Uh, Brent has it. Um, I think if uh, Soldner, I think Soldner has one. Um, a couple of them have these specific legs for their wheels, um, so you can get that too to make it so you can throw standing. Um, as far as the 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 leverage goes as well, if I'm throwing sitting, basically the most pressure I can put on something is the weight of my upper body. If I'm throwing standing, I can actually kind of straighten up my body and just lean into the pot and it gives me a lot more force than I'm going to have if I'm trying to throw sitting. Um, getting a wheel. So this is one of three wheels that I own. Uh, this is my lightest weight one. It's great for sticking up on a tabletop, carrying to demos. It's a great spare wheel. And I actually do most of my throwing on this wheel at this point. Uh, it's based off of the old Shimpo, um, kind of like Ship's Prow design from the 50s to 80s, I think they were making that one. Um, it's also one I have. Um, I have one of those from 1957, I believe. Uh, they're indestructible. They're fantastic wheels. This wheel essentially has a, um, like a, a treadmill motor in it. It's a direct drive. Um, it doesn't have a pedal. It doesn't have a lever or anything. It just has a uh, little dial on the side. So if I turn it on, I just turn the dial. It gives me my speed. When I was throwing production, we worked on line shaft wheels. So there was like a belt that went up to the ceiling and the wheels were actually kind of difficult to change the speed on. Um, and even if you weren't working on one of the line shaft ones, you really got out of the habit of, of using anything like a pedal because you're standing. And if you're throwing with a pedal standing, the pedal puts one foot at an angle if you're gonna operate it. You also have to put the other foot at an angle um, for that to be safe for your back. Same thing with sitting. Um, it's kind of like when you're driving in your car, you've got a, an angled piece off to the left uh, where you're supposed to rest your left foot if your right foot is on an angled pedal. That prevents you from getting back injuries. So um, don't really use pedals. Don't really... Levers are great, but honestly, this dial is fantastic. I can just put the wheel at the speed I want. Um, this motor is weak enough that I can stop the wheel head, but I can throw up to like 15 pounds of clan here, no problem. This wheel costs uh, just under $200. A um, 
more of like a commercial um, ceramics wheel, like a, a Brent or some, or a, a new Shimpo. They're going to be up to like 1400 1800 bucks at this point. And they've got more horsepower. They've got a lot more torque to them. But for 99% of wheel throwers, this is all you'll ever need is something like this. It's easier to put away, easier to afford. If it ever breaks, you just buy another one. I don't even know if it'd be worth fixing. Brents break. Um, expensive wheels break. Uh, pedals are especially difficult to keep working. So um, I don't know that for most hobbyists there's any need to get a really expensive wheel. Um, horsepower with wheels. So basically you'll, you'll see there's like half horse, quarter horse, one horsepower wheels. Horsepower is about torque. So torque is how much weight can you turn slowly and without stopping the wheel head. So it's slow power. And the reason you need more torque is if you're trying to throw something that's a really large diameter, like a platter, and you need to slow the wheel down because that big diameter, it starts to go faster and faster the larger, the further out on that rim you get. So a really large platter is traveling very fast on the rim, even if the center of the wheel is turning slowly. And you have a big lever. If you're out here on the rim and I grip down on that, that's an effective much larger lever and I can stop a slower horsepower wheel very easily like that. Oh, like you saw me stop this one. So unless you're throwing 36 inch platters, honestly, or regularly throwing 50 pound pots, there's not much need for a high horsepower wheel. And frankly, I would say it's worth the 200 bucks to buy a cheaper wheel. And then when you outgrow it, buy a more expensive wheel. Um, no reason to get an expensive one out uh, at the beginning. Okay, so um, let's see, other things about what I got going here. Uh, I don't use a lot of tools when I'm throwing, mostly uh, sponge. Um, these sponges are actually, uh, drop a name here, um, Detroit Sponge and Chamois, my favorite sponge supplier in the world. They sell these flat uh, window washer sponges. This is a, a high density hydrophilic sponge, and I actually just slice them on the bandsaw. Um, what I like about this sponge is, all right, so looks like not a lot of, there's no water dripping out of this. This tiny sponge, can hold a fantastic amount of water. And it's very, very thin, so I can feel things through it. And especially when you're doing production work, the idea is that you don't want to keep going to the water bowl constantly. If I can squeeze water into the piece as I'm throwing, throwing with the sponge is really good. For early on with your wheel throwing, it's not going to matter as much. Um, you're throwing, I don't know, honestly, under three pounds. You'll, you'll gain you'll gain something from using the sponge, but not as much as you will later when you're trying to do more mass and you need the sponge also to distribute the force from your fingers. Um, I have fairly round sausage-like fingers, um, so they don't dig in a whole lot, but if I push through a sponge, they don't dig in hardly at all. And the larger the clay mass is, the more force I have to apply in order to get it to move, and the broader the surface I want to apply that force. The sponge is really helpful for that. All right, so I got my sponge. I have a um, sharp, uh, squared, angled uh, wooden rib. Uh, I actually make these now. Kemper used to make them. I don't believe they do make them anymore. So this is one that I made. And a short angle um, wooden tool that I use for cleaning the pieces up towards the end. Uh, often I'll have a chamois, so just a little wet piece of leather or a piece of uh, heavy plastic, uh, a cloth, a lot of things work for that. Water bowl, um, big sponge for cleaning my hands. That's pretty much it. So, I'm going to talk about a few more things as we get going here. Um, I've already wedged my clay. I've got a video on wedging, so you can look at that if you want all the information there is on wedging. And this is in a conical shape um, with a rounded bottom so that when I throw this down into the wheel head, it pushes the air out. I don't get air trapped underneath the clay. I'm not going to use a lot of water. I just want this to be tacky, uh, but I don't want it to be slick. And the first time I'm putting the clay down, you know, use these concentric rings that are on your wheel head and make your life easy. Just make sure this thing's in the middle and get it into like a mushroom cap shape to start off with. A lot of people try and throw pieces which are too tall. The lumps are way too tall. Um, I think the feeling is that 
I've got this tall lump, and if I make a hole in this tall lump, I've already got a wall, and I'm like ahead of the game. And it's the exact opposite. Uh, you're going to have a lot more problems trying to throw a tall lump than a shorter lump. And you'll kind of see some of that when I get started here. All right, so I've got it stuck down really good. And I basically I'm going to throw it like three different speeds. I've got a centering speed, I've got my initial pulling speed, and I've got my finish pulling speed. Um, it gets decreasingly fast as I go. And um, the first thing I need to do is I'm going to use my sponge here to put some pressure in the bottom edge and just make sure this lump is all the way stuck down under the wheel head. So that's stuck down really nice. And then the next thing I'm going to do is use the edges of my hands and squeezing some water, the sponge, and kind of a motion sort of like this, almost like cupping water, just to get this so that it's stuck down even better. Now, as part of that process, it's going to be pushed up. It's going to cone the clay. It's going to make it more into a conical shape. And you'll notice that if I'm trying to put pressure on the clay, I'm actually going to bring this arm towards my stomach and lean into it and turn it more into a piston. I don't want to come out here. You don't want to have chicken wings. And you also want to make sure that your, your arms are supported and your hands are supported at all times. So I'm going to be leaning on the edge of the bin here. If that cuts into your arms, you can use a um, piece of um, uh, plumbing um, pipe insulating uh, foam. You can kind of put that on there and make it a little bit more comfortable, especially on the Brent wheels. They dig in a lot. All right, so I do this little motion here. It makes it go up. And then you want to actually push this clay down. Now, when you see people do this, generally you've got both hands on the wheel. Uh, on the clay, and it's hard for you to actually see what's happening. So I'll describe what I'm actually doing here. Rather than coming down onto the top of the clay, um, I'm actually coming at like a 45 degree angle. And this part of the clay is going to the center of my hand. And because my hand isn't symmetrical, I want to come at it at an angle and push into, like at a 45 degree angle, into the wheel head. If I come straight down on it, because my hand isn't symmetrical, it's going to kind of start wobbling around and it's going to give you this weird like muffin top kind of a thing. Uh, well, yeah, let's go ahead and show you. So if I come straight down, eventually the shape of my hand, which isn't symmetrical, is going to give you something like this. So what I want to do, go ahead and cone this up again, is put this part in the center of my hand. And I'm going to keep my other hand out of here just so that you can kind of see what's happening. And I'm going to push from the side here too, again, so that you can see. Normally I would push this way, but just for the camera, I'm going to push in this direction. So I'm actually pushing at an angle into the wheel head. And you see what happens? I'm using the screw force, the rotation of the wheel, to my advantage, rather than it just kind of not doing me any good. The wheel's already doing a lot of work. There's a lot of kinetic energy here. So if I just push the clay at an angle, the screw mechanism is going to make it go flat. So now I've got a nice little mushroom cap. Uh, frankly, this is, this is this is the centered as you need. Um, dirty secret of wheel throwing, there are actually two stages when you can center the clay. And this is the first stage. Most people don't teach both stages. So the first stage is centering the lump like this. But what happens when you open the lump? Generally, you're going to make that off center again. So the other part is centering the coil. So we've centered the lump first. Next, I'm going to keep my, my hands, arms braced, touch down here. I'm going to keep my thumb straight. My hand is resting on the wheel head, so you actually see a clean spot there. I keep my thumb straight, and I'm going to push my thumb down with the sponge. All right, how do I know when to stop? How do I know what the floor thickness is? I'm using kind of the comfort level of when I push my thumb down, it kind of wants to stop at a certain point. And so I'm learning that the thickness of the wall is that difference between where my thumb stops and the bottom of the wheel head. And I prefer to teach people that method from testing it with a pin tool at some point and kind of seeing how thick it is. You're always going to be able to judge in relation to your own kind of anatomy. And it's much easier if you can just stop at that point when it's not comfortable with your thumb anymore and learn that that's the correct thickness. Once I've got this shape uh, dug into the center, I'm going to, again, rest my hand on the wheel head, 
put my fingers down and I'm just gonna curl my fingers towards my own palm. I'm not gonna do something like this. That motion is really weak. This, this motion is really strong. Keeping things right here like this is gonna make it so that it's much easier to control opening up this floor. And I'm gonna open that floor up wider than I'm actually gonna want, probably like 20, 30% wider. The reason that I'm gonna open it up wider is that after I'm done compressing the floor here and I go to pull up a wall, I'm gonna put a significant amount of force at the bottom of the clay, of the, the coil here, and that's gonna push the floor in slightly. So if you've ever had a pot where, uh, or a lot of pots where at the end of it, you know, you opened it up flat when you started, but at the end, you just have like a U-shaped um, cross-section to the pot, and it's not actually nice and square like this. That's because you didn't give yourself a little extra. And it's just, just kind of how it goes is that the inside hand, the non-dominant hand is usually gonna give away a little bit when you push from the outside. It's hard to get away from it. Uh, so make it a little bit wider than you want. After I've compressed it with my sponge and my fingers, I'm gonna use the rib and I'm gonna compress I kind of start off at, a, at an angle so that I tip the, the um, rib towards the center. So it's like a rocking motion. So I basically kind of, this is exaggerated, but starting at the tip, rocking flat. I don't just start flat. And I want to get this nice and compressed. Um, all right, why are we compressing the floor? Um, I can't, you know, there's a lot of these things that um, they kind of tell people to do them and... Uh, it's like sacrificing a chicken. We don't really explain why we're doing it or what the science is behind it. Um, so uh, if you've ever wondered why is it that water stays in a pond um, or in a lake, it's basically the, the weight of the water hyper compresses the clay layer at the bottom of the pond or the lake. And there's this point of compression that clay reaches where it essentially becomes waterproof. It's, it's just this right amount of moisture and it's just this right amount of compression and water won't soak through it anymore. And so that's why the water stays in the pond. And we're basically trying to duplicate that effect here. We want to compress this floor so that as we're throwing, when we invariably fill this up like a little tiny lake, we don't want that water to soak into the clay. Why? Why, why do we care? Why do we care if it gets soaks into the clay? Well, we care because this clay is going to shrink about nine to 12 percent from wet to fully fired and glazed and it's been shrinking a good like five six percent just from wet to dry um, to the bisque stage or the greenway stage and that shrinkage is going to depend on the amount of moisture that's in the clay so if i let water soak into the bottom here this clay will actually become larger it'll become more swelled with water than the clay in the walls when the whole thing shrinks and dries, especially if it dries quickly, the bottom is going to shrink more than the sides, and it's going to open up in what's called an S-crack. So that's where those come from. The S-crack in the bottom is basically because the bottom is bigger than the walls, and it just shrinks more. So I want to avoid that, compress the bottom. It's also going to keep things just nice and stable in the firing. And um, after I've done that, usually this coil is going to be thrown off. It won't be as exact as it is here. I'm going to... I'm going to bump it off for you. There we go. It's going to look more something like this. And now I want to actually kind of center this coil. So to center the coil, I'm going to um, let this clay kind of run through my hand like a rope. And I make sure that there's lots of water here, and I'm going to squeeze more water as I go. And I'm going to kind of do three different things. The finger on the inside becomes a wall. My finger on the top becomes a ceiling. My thumb on the outside is the only thing that's going to move up and down to feel, as I put pressure on this coil, if it's even. I want to put pressure on the top so that it can't go up. I'm going to put pressure on the inside so that it can't go in. And only my thumb is going up and down and kind of letting me feel that that's correct. To do my first pull, again, in production work, you kind of want to speed things up as much as you can and you're going for efficiency. So... I find that the, the, the strength of this shape here, keeping my thumb and my finger as the things that are actually doing the first pull, is much better than this. This is very, very weak. This is very, very strong. Just like when we open the floor, this is very strong, but this is very weak. So I want that strength. And 
we're also trying to do something which is counterintuitive um, and explain why it's so difficult for so many people to pull up a wall. Um, if you is it, close your eyes, when you close your eyes, you can just stick your fingertips together. Like, no, no problem. It's like really easy. We are hardwired as mammals to be able to do this. We, we have an, an instinctive sense of where the ends of our hands are. Um, so we want to line up our fingertips. That's great. To pull a wall, though, you actually need to go against that. A pull is me getting underneath the clay and being, having my finger on the inside and my fingers on the outside being offset, not lining up. I naturally line them up. You have to really work at it to not line them up. So if I want to get it to come up, I have to get one finger or my thumb under the other one and maintain that offset as I come up. Otherwise, I'm not really pulling the clay. If I line them up and I just go for, oh, fingertips want to touch each other, that's just what they do, then the, that's just putting pressure. All I'm doing is squeezing the clay. I'm not controlling it. And the only shaping force is centrifugal force. And I just get a bolt. So the moment it starts wanting to go out, I know my fingers have lined up and I'm not lifting anymore. You also won't see a little coil. Let's go ahead and sacrifice this one so you guys can see what that actually looks like. So I get this coil centered. I dig my thumb in. Now, because my finger is on the floor inside here, it's already offset from my thumb, which was laying flat on the bat. So if I can maintain that offset as I pull up, then I can naturally do my first pull. Going for a cylinder. So when you're going for cylinders, you want to tip that clay in. You want to think about coming into the middle as you're doing your pull. Um, again, that's not going to be your natural instinct. Your natural instinct is to give in to centrifugal force a little bit and kind of allow the wheel head to spread it out at the top. You don't want to do that. So my first pull I did with my thumb going underneath my forefinger. My second pull though, I'm going to slow this down just a teeny little bit, is going to be my fingers on the outside, digging in, and then tucking underneath my middle finger on the inside. Why do I switch from my index to my middle finger? Because my index finger is longer, and it touches the floor of the pot faster than my other finger does. Some of this depends on your own ergonomics. So I tend to use my index finger. All right, so you'll see I dig underneath the, the clay now. This lump is the tip of my index finger. All right, so this is where this guy gets sacrificed. Normally I'm gonna keep coming up to the top, but we're gonna show you what this is looking like. All right, shut this off, clean my hands. Um, I clean my hands reflexively, constantly. Usually I have a larger bowl of water that's in the way if I'm trying to video, so I got a smaller one today. But I'm constantly cleaning my hands because stick your, if your hands have a lot of slip on them, if there's a lot of clay in your hands, Clay is sticky, water is slippery. You want clean hands and as little clay in the water as possible and you'll need less water on the pot. Why do you care? Because as you're working, it's absorbing all that water into the clay. And you'll hear people talk about how like, oh, a mug should take, you know, like three minutes to throw a mug. Uh, it's not really like a macho thing, like I can throw a mug in three minutes. It's because if you go longer than three minutes, the clay is just absorbing water, absorbing, 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 and it gets spongy and you can't manipulate it anymore. So the, the less water I use on it, the faster I can make this, the easier it is to shape. All right, so I cut this in half um, just so that I can show you guys. When I'm throwing, what I'm doing is this. So this bend is my fingertip. I'm staying underneath that as I pull up. And another important thing to point out here is each time I pull, a certain amount of this is finished. That first pull, this is done, basically. It's the right thickness. The second pull, like this much of it's going to be done. The third pull, I'm actually only lifting like maybe the bottom inch, and that's it. The rest of it is just follow through to continue up to the top. I'm not trying to keep squeezing the clay all the way every time. 
If you do that, you're going to thin it out, you're going to overstretch the clay, and you're going to have a lot of problems. All right. After you've gotten your first one stuck down, don't clean this off. You went through a lot of effort to get this clay on here, so now your future lumps are going to stick a lot better than the first one. Again, just tacky, not slippery. Put that in the middle there. Make it easy on yourself. All right, nice mushroom cap. Get my wheel turning. Let's go ahead and go ahead. Let's go ahead and get to the second pole again. Sticking down this edge with my fingertip, using the cupping motion of my hands to make sure this is stuck down some more. For extra force, I bring my arm in and tuck it and use it as a piston. I can continue that motion to cone this clay up a little bit. Then I'm going to put it in the center of my hand and push away to go down. My other hand is there just to support. And honestly, because for the most part, you're always going to do things with two hands or with at least a sense that there's another surface that you're pushing against. That surface might be the wheel head. That surface might be your other hand, the edge of your pan. It's, it's something else that you're, you're pushing against. You're very, almost never using just one hand when you're throwing. All right, I'm go ahead and open up this lump. Got my arm resting on the edge of the pan. I'm keeping my thumb straight. I'm going down to make a V-shaped opening. When I'm done, I'm going to curl my fingertip toward my own palm, open this up a little bit wider than I need it to be, compress the floor with my sponge, back and forth a couple of times. There we go. I'm actually putting quite a bit of force on that. Then I'm going to use my wooden tool, starting at an angle, and kind of rock it into being flat, and go back and forth, make sure that that's nice and compressed. All right, center my coil, get that controlled, dig my thumb underneath. My first pull is a lift with just my one hand, thumb underneath my forefinger, lifting it up. When I'm done, I always compress this top edge with my sponge, just to make sure that that clay isn't getting sloppy and thrown off as I go. Not a bad thing to lose a little bit of clay at the bottom. Our fingers are not angular. There's always gonna be a little bit of slop down here and that just comes off. If you find you're losing a ton of clay, um, a good trick is to basically like weigh the clay when you're done and then see maybe the amount that you're using, you're just not using it. Um, try subtracting that amount of clay from the next lump. See if you can make the same size piece just without that clay being there, because you probably will. Use my finger on the inside to pour some water down. And then I can change the speed a little bit if I want, get this a little bit slower. Give yourself some time on the outside here to get underneath your fingertip. Now that I'm underneath it, I'm going to pull up. Once I get to about here, I'm just kind of continuing the motion up. I'm not really lifting anymore. That clay was mostly done. Right about there. At this point, this much clay is pretty much done. All I'm going to lift is right here. And remember, you're, you're going to only get the size cylinder that you, the height that you can at the width that you're making it. Um, a little confusing, but, so I'm throwing with a pound and a half of clay. Always recommend that you use a known quantity of clay every time you throw. You're not gonna have any benchmark for your progress or how you're doing if you're constantly using different amounts of clay. So try and force yourself to, for each session, throw with specific weights. And I'm throwing specifically with a pound and a half. I know that if I make the diameter around like this, a pound and a half of clay cylinder, I should be able to get to about there um, at this diameter. If I'd made him wider like this, I'm not gonna get that high. Don't try and get that tall with a bit bigger diameter. It's gonna be about that tall. I see stu students a lot of times having something that's a wider diameter than what I demoed, trying to get to the same height that I got to, and the pieces just collapse because the walls are way too thin. So there's a certain proportion that's actually appropriate for the amount of clay that you're using for the size that you're going for. All right, now this arm has to be unsupported in order for me to be able to do this pull, but I'm making sure that my other arm is really well tucked into my side. I can get underneath here. All right, I'm doing my pull. I'm mostly done right there. 
Now I'm just keeping it even as I come up to finish. My right arm is really well braced. So my left hand being a little more floppy in the air doesn't matter as much. Kind of locked in with my right. Okay, I'm gonna take this tool and I'm gonna cut a little angle at the bottom, then reverse it, clean that off. Why do I do that? Gonna take that clay off no matter what. It's sloppy clay, it's not compressed, it's not gonna be used, it's gonna get trimmed off later. Why trim it off later if I can trim it off now when I can more easily recycle that clay? Um, it's gonna be a lot less work to recycle this slop, put on some plaster, dry it out, than to wait until it's leather hard shavings and I gotta add water and do a whole bunch of other things to get it to be in good shape. So why don't I get it now? Um, most of the work that I did, especially in production, we did a lot of decorating on them. And so I'm in the habit at this point of always ribbing my pieces um, just to get rid of the throwing lines. In the case of a small piece like this, and especially the specific cup, this is a decision which is about aesthetics and how I'm going to decorate it and not a decision having to do with the structural integrity of the piece or needing to compress it that way with the rib. It is helpful though, and when you start throwing bowls, it is a structural decision. Um, compression like that will really help your bowls maintain their shape and will really help you with shaping the bowls. I'm going to clean up that bottom edge again, clean off my wheel head. No sense to keep things sloppy. It's actually good if you can keep things really clean. Now I can use my chamois here and I can compress this top edge. There you go. It also gives you a really nice smooth finish to the edge. Uh, it's a lot nicer uh, when you're drinking out of it. And I can turn this guy off and he's done. Um, wires. I, I don't like wrapping wires around my fingers. Um, I've seen accidents where the wire will catch, especially if you, you wire off on a, a moving wheel. I, I don't condone wiring moving wheels. Um, I'm doing this on a metal wheel head, so there's not much to catch, but especially if you're on like a plastic bat or a wooden bat, and if that wire catches part of it, um, you can lose a finger like that. So I don't actually like doing this. I would much rather have a shorter wire and um, just trim the wire down so that I can have a short wire for cutting underneath. In this case, for the purpose of the demo, I gotta do it. I'm gonna make the wire tight, push it down flat with my thumbs, pull it under the piece. This clay is fairly coarse and it doesn't wanna stick back onto the wheel head right away, but clay like porcelain or porcelainous clays, or very white clays are often sticky and you'll pull the wire through once and stick right back down again. If you have a clay like that, you pull your wire through, pull a little water in front, pull the water underneath once or twice, and then you can lift the piece off. Um, if you, especially if you rid the outside of it like this and you kept your hands clean, I can dry my hands off and I can just pick the piece right up. Uh, they should just stick to the piece and it should be easy to move it around. And we'll cut this one in half. Demos don't live. All right, there you go. And you can see nice even wall thickness. Uh, the bottom is basically the same thickness. And, you know, could this be thinner? Sure, you can make it as thin as you want. Uh, go crazy. Um, I find for most um, things that are going to be used for um, actually eating and drinking out of, um, anything that's supposed to really be functional, that there's a minimum thickness, frankly, for durability, for the thermal sink. Um, you want if this is gonna be a mug for coffee, I don't want something that's gonna become cold in two seconds. Um, I don't want something where if I go to grab it and I don't use the handle, I'm gonna burn my hand because the mug is so thin. So, you know, thin mugs, I mean, you, you pour the coffee in, ah, I can't touch it. And then you come back two minutes later, eh, it's cold. I mean, it's just the worst ever. So I, I think this is a great thickness for a mug, personally. Um, I'd go a little bit thinner and then that'd be about it. Um, thinnest I would go is like this guy here, who's like maybe a quarter thinner, um, but I don't mind that. Okay. And I would say, you know, if, if you want to kind of chase the thinness, uh, it's not a bad thing. Um, you know, make that kind of part of your journey, not like the entire goal. Uh, you'll get there.
if you gradually, if you're throwing with the same weight clay, if you're aiming for the same size pieces, it will get more efficient each time you throw. If I throw that exact same cylinder again, the next one will be a little bit taller, probably a little bit wider and a little bit thinner. I'll dial it in. It takes about three to five pieces. If I'm sitting down to do a lot of throwing, the first three, I toss them. They're just warm up. Haven't thrown anything else today. These, this is a warm up basically. So not gonna sweat it. Um, pretty much that's it. Another little tip for you before we sign off on this demo. When you're not throwing on the wheel, just put your sponge on that, keeps this damp. So when you come back, you can still stick to it. Don't clean it off if you think you'll be coming back to work. And just as far as like, um, kind of like how you're, you're scheduling or, or arranging your day for working. I, when I come into the studio, um, the first thing that I do is check all my pots from the previous sessions, see if anything needs to be unwrapped um, so it can dry while I'm working. Then I throw at the beginning so that those pieces can then be drying while I then do my finishing or decorating work on the previous day's work, um, or if I have anything like glazing to get to. So generally throwing is done when I'm fresh and the finishing work um, is done later in the day. Um, a lot of wheel throwing, this, this is physical and um, it's important that if you're gonna do this as a living or uh, in some kind of production capacity, that you have other options and you have things that you can do when you have days where you're having problems throwing. Uh, when we did a lot of um, uh, wheel throwing, we make as many as three to 400 pieces a week. And there were points where our, our wrists would go. We'd have to tape our wrists to keep them rigid. Uh, your, your hands will just ache. Um, so there, there's going to be days, it's, it's like any physical activity, there's days where you're not feeling it, it's not easy to do. Um, it's nice if you don't make your days nothing but throwing, and then the next day nothing but finishing. Your finishing is going to always take longer than your throwing, or it should. Um, I shall leave you on this thought. What you want to do is triple the amount of time at each stage when you're working. If it takes me three minutes to throw this mug, it should take me at least nine to 10 minutes to trim it, finish it, put a handle on it. Then it should take 30 minutes to glaze. If I increase the amount of time that I'm spending on it, the amount of time that I commit to it, it's easier for me to take a weak piece and make it great. If you do the opposite, and you're throwing a piece in three minutes, you slap a handle on it in one minute, and you dunk it in a bucket of glaze for 30 seconds, you can take a decent pot and trash it down the road. So you've got some investment in time with these things, put more time into it and give yourself a chance to use every stage as an opportunity to learn another thing. You need to practice handles, you need to practice trimming, you need to practice glazing. Don't leave off those stages because at first they're hard. When you get down the line a year, two years out, and you're making pots you really love, don't let that be the first time that you're thinking about trimming or finishing or decorating or handles, because now you're gonna have pieces you care about that you're putting lousy handles on. So put your lousy handles on your weaker work up front when you're learning everything. All right, I'll leave you with that. And um, next time we will uh, talk about bowls probably. So thanks very much. Thank you for tuning in.